Mm. Hello. Sorry, we had a little bit of sound issues with that video. It is incredible. And for everyone who hasn't read the book, uh, it would make you want to read the book even more. So I do apologize. And I will share that video to everyone who has bought a ticket because it is absolutely worth watching. But now, without further ado, uh, thank you so much for joining us for Left Bank Books and Crime Reads welcomes acclaimed writer Elon Green, who will discuss his new book, Last Call, A True Story of Love, Lust, and Murder in Queer New York. Green will be on a panel with true crime masters David Grann, Robert Kolker, and Sarah Weinman. The event will now be moderated by executive managing editor and copy chief of Random House, Benjamin Fryer. Left Bank Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We would like to thank all of our supporters, the supporters of Elon, David, Robert, Sarah, Benjamin, Crime Reads, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. Left Bank Books offers curbside pickup and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. We are incredibly happy to be able to bring our event series virtual. We believe that events are a way to expand your mind and bring in new thoughts to make the world a better place. We hope that you enjoy this event and we hope that you support Left Bank Books by purchasing another signed copy of Last Call for your friends or any other book, uh, including all of the fantastic books by all of our panelists this evening. And purchasing a copy of the book from Left Bank Books allows us to keep our bookstore and staff operating. Thank you for your support. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books and big true crime fan. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis. We will be taking questions from you, the audience, at the end of the event. So you can type those questions as a comment at any point in time throughout the event. And I will be moderating those for the Q&A at the end. And be sure to follow Left Bank Books on Facebook to be notified about all of our fantastic virtual events. And now I would like to welcome to the screen Molly Odnitz, who is Odnitz, uh, who is the senior editor for Crime Reads, the world's premier website for lovers of crime fiction, mystery, thrillers, and true crime. And here is Molly. Hello, Molly. Thank you, Shane, and good evening, everyone. I'm so excited that Crime Reads is getting a, ch a chance to sponsor this event along with Left Bank and with Sell Add-On because um, we just turned three years old as a website, so it feels nice to, to be doing things like this. Uh, welcome to our Masters of the True Crime Genre event celebrating the launch of Elon Green's Last Call. That was my phone falling. We have an incredible panel with us tonight, so let's get right to our introductions, which in the interest of time, we are abbreviating because all of these panelists have accomplished so much in their illustrious careers. Elon Green has written for many acclaimed outlets, including the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, and The New Yorker. He has also been an editor at Long Form since 2011. Sarah Weinman is the author of The Real Lolita and editor of Unspeakable Acts, True Tales of Crime, Murder, Deceit, and Obsession. A National and Magazine Award finalist in reporting, Weinman's work has appeared in New York, Vanity Fair, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times, where she writes the crime column for the book review. Robert Kolker is an author whose most recent book, Hidden Valley Road, was an instant number one New York Times bestseller and a selection of Oprah's book club that was named a top 10 book of the year by the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal, and the number one book of the year by People. David Gran is a number one New York Times bestselling author and an award-winning staff writer at the New Yorker magazine. His book, Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI, documented one of the most sinister crimes and racial injustices in American history. It was a finalist for the National Book Award and winner of the Edgar Allan Poe Award for Best True Crime Book, and is now being adapted into a major motion picture directed by Martin Scorsese. And last but not least, tonight's moderator is Benjamin Dreyer, the author of the New York Times bestseller, Dreyer's English. He is the executive managing editor and copy chief of Random House. And now over to you, Ben. All right. And I just want to add that this is today, 
This is the book birthday. So a happy special book birthday to you, Elon. Thanks, Jay. And thank you guys for coming. Well, so I get to be the odd man out <clears throat> as a writer um, because you all have your, your, your beats and I have a beat that's somewhere else entirely. But the one thing that does um, uh, make me happy to be here and make me a uh, part of this conversation is that I have been, for all the time that I have been reading, I am devoted to reading books about terrible things that happen to real people. Um, because it's because it's fascinating because it's 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 experiencing something that you never want to be in the middle of but for some reason it is fascinating to read about the things that have happened to to other people um for whatever emotional and moral value that may have but so i really do i i i want to start um I, I want to start with a question that I think will will be good for all of you, but we'll, let's start with our our, our birthday fellow uh, tonight. Let's start let's start with Elon. I mean, when one speaks to novelists, when one speaks to writers of fiction, you can ask them where this idea came from. Was it an image? Was it a thought? Was it something you overheard in a, in a cafe that inspired you to think, oh, there's a whole story that I can weave about that? But in 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 the sorts of books that you all uh, are, are, uh, have written and are writing. It's not a matter of the inspiration of some fantasy. It's an actual thing that happened. So Elon, I would like to start, I would like to start with you and, and very simply ask you, where did you find the story of last call? Um, well, I found it in the October, 1994 issue of the advocate, uh, you know, wonderful, you know, many decades old uh, uh, queer publication. And in 1994, the case that I'm writing about had been cold uh, for a year. And, uh, you know, part of the, the story was asking why hadn't it been solved? And when I was reading about the case and the advocate, uh, my question was, what is this case and why haven't I heard about it? And um, that's what sent me down the path, was uh, just wanting to know more uh, about the victims. And, and now, Sarah, you're, you're particularly known for a book that's a, it's a fascinating intersection of, of crime and literature. Um, where, where, how did you, how did you find your way to, uh, uh, Sally is her name, right? Sally Horner. Yes. Yeah. Where, how did you find your way to Sally's story? I think it was around the end of 2013 or thereabouts. And I had just finished a story that would appear in the New York times magazine on uh, a man serving a life sentence for murder who ended up publishing a crime novel after winning a private detective novel contest. So I was looking around for my next idea and I I knew I had seen this piece before, but I think it just didn't register. And so when I read it again, it was this 2005 essay by the Nabokov scholar Alexander Dolanin called What Happened to Sally Horner, which connected the 1948 kidnapping of this 11 year old girl in Camden, New Jersey with Nabokov's Lolita and showing how it was a lot more intertwined than people thought and how Lolita actually included a parenthetical that Humbert Humbert utters, had I done to Dol had I done to her, meaning Dolores Hayes, what um, Frank LaSalle, a 50 year old mechanic had done to 11 year old Sally Horner in 1948. And so realizing that this girl had lived, that she would eventually live a very short, brief, tragic life, I wanted to know more about her and I wanted to understand who she was, what kind of life she'd had in this abbreviated time, and moreover, why it had not really been fully reported out. So it began as a magazine piece for the Canadian publication Hazlitt, and then I expanded it into a book when I realized there was just a lot more to say and many more questions that I wanted to answer, not just about Sally herself, but about the responsibility that we have in making art and what we borrow from real life. And I feel like it just 
kind of changed how I thought about not only literature, but also crime reporting, that it's so important to figure out what we're doing with other people's trauma and pain. And I feel like that's just become even more central to not only what I do, but what Elon does in Last Call and so many sort of up and coming people in the nonfiction crime space. It's both exciting, but also um, a little queasy. And I think that's a good thing because a lot of true crime is queasy making. And I think we really have to interrogate why we do it and who it's for and what responsibility that we have. Which I think, Sarah, makes um, makes me lean to the left, or at least to my left, because I want to ask Bob um, about 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 his most recent book, and and specifically, you know, we are not necessarily talking about true crime. We are talking about a sort of a a, a great big family tragedy, and 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 may I ask you how you found your way to that story? Bob, are you mute? Are you muted on your end or our end? Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Oh, there we uh, go. I, I um, I was saying that uh, I got acquainted with this family because I had written a true crime book before called Lost Girls that, um, that not just told the story about uh, the who done it or the crime itself, but also took a look at the people swept up in the crime and took a close look at their lives. And I think that is is what I admire most about what Elon's done and Sarah and David and their work as well. They sort of help us remember the forgotten people that are part of stories that are both compelling but also lift the veil on a part of the world that you never get to see. So while my latest book may not technically be a true crime book, it really is about along those lines. It's about people in crisis, a family in crisis, and about a deeper issue uh, running beneath the surface. And a, and and it's sociology too. Uh, I think Elon's book in particular is is wonderful and the sociological score. You you see a whole world inside New York that you may not have ever even known much about. Even if you lived through it, you may not have known much about it. So it's it was exciting to read in that way. And and David, I particularly um, I mean when I when I think about your work, we are talking about, I mean, in 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 one particular in in, in one instance, a, a wonderful story of 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 very American crime. Um, and in another in, in in another work, a a work of historical spectacle. Um, wh where where do you where do you look? Where do you go? Are these things that you that you were carrying around with you for a while, or are they things that just sort of popped up by accident in front of you? There's a muting issue. It's probably the same problem I had. Hold up. Did that work? There we go. Okay, sorry. Um, I never quite think of myself as a as a, a true crime writer. I. Um, look at myself as someone who's looking for stories about things I don't know, that things I think we should know. <clears throat> and I look for those, you know, in the same way all reporters do, which is, um, you know, reading newspapers, reading obscure journals, looking for that one line in brief of that kind of piques your interest, um, talking to people. Uh, Sarah Wyman, if she ever wanted to, she is, um, the source of more uh, story ideas than anyone I know uh, in knowing uh, all this kind of literature and realm. Um, but I also think I share something with all the writers here, and I think Elon's book is such a testament to this, um, which is, for example, with Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, that came about when I heard about the story about this kind of systematic murder of um, the Osage people in Oklahoma, who in the early 20th century had become the wealthiest people in the world because of oil under their land. And then they began to be systematically killed. And when I learned about it, I couldn't find much written about it. And I had traveled out to uh, Osage uh, territory. And I know uh, a lot of people have heard this story before, but it really was the origin. And it speaks to something that I think everyone on this panel has spoken to, which was I went to the museum. And uh, when I was there, 
um, I saw this great photograph on the wall, which was taken in the early uh, 1920s, and it showed members of the Osage Nation along with white settlers. Um, and it looked very innocent, but a portion of that photograph had been had been cut out. And I asked the, the museum director what had happened to it, and she pointed to that missing panel, and she said the devil was standing right there. And then she went down into the basement, and she showed me an image of the missing panel, which showed one of the killers of the Osage and that moment, you know, a lot of stories don't have origin stories like this, but that was the origin story. And I kept, you know, thinking in that moment that the Osage and, and Catherine Redcorn, the museum director, who's since become a good friend of mine, she had removed that photo because the Osage couldn't forget what happened. And yet so many people, including myself, had never been taught this. We didn't know it. And we had excised it from our conscious. So what propelled me to tell that particular story was in many ways to address my own ignorance and hopefully to address a broader ignorance. Well, David, you've actually you've actually led me to two of the questions that I wanted to ask. And this is sort of tricky for me because it's like I have 50 questions and I want to ask them all at once, um, which is simply not going to work. But the two point two of the points that, that you raise that I would like to uh, pursue with, with with all of you are the the sleuthing and where the sleuthing leads you and the idea of writing a story about something that we don't know, which also means perhaps a story about something that you don't know until you're doing the legwork, until you're doing the sleuth work. Um, and so I, I, I'd love to hear about that, but I, I would also really like to hear from all of you about how, how your work is informed by a sense of place which I think is, is very important um, in books, uh, uh, in all kinds of books, um, but, but how vividly your work is informed by that sense of place. So Elon, can, can, can we hear from you a bit about, um, you know, where your, exploration, where your explorations led particularly where they led to places where you didn't necessarily know they were going. And I, I would also love to hear about how, um, because you are a New Yorker and because you are writing a New York crime story, what your, you know, what your wanderings were like as you were, uh, a, 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 as you were working on this project. Yeah. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, although it is a, a New York story, you know, it did end up taking me, into places, sometimes literally, sometimes not, uh, that I didn't expect. I mean, there are scenes in uh, on St. Martin, uh, Youngstown, Ohio, uh, Philadelphia, Boston, uh, Toronto. Um, and, you know, and the obligation is, you know, when you're writing about a place, uh, you can't just parachute in, you've got to get it right. Um, and, and that was just unexpected, but the more you, you know, you learn about a story, uh, the more places you end up going. And, um, especially when a, a story crosses, uh, decades and, um, you know, as far as, as far as the sleuthing, uh, you know, and, and, you know, doing a New York story, uh, it really covered the waterfront. Uh, you know, it went anywhere from, uh, you know, retired detectives to the archives of uh, uh, Tom Dwayne's archives in the LGBT center, uh, where, which helped me put together the history of the anti-violence project. Um, you know, I flew out to Santa Fe, New Mexico to interview the sister uh, of, of one of the men who had been killed. Um, I drove out to a, a hospital in Lancaster County uh, to meet with the retired detectives because they wanted to give me handwritten notes uh, from the case in person. Um, you know, I, you, you go wherever is, is necessary to get either a, a, a lot of information or that one vital piece of information that you need to make paragraph work. And, you know, sometimes that happened too. I mean, but then, you know, also there were less traditional means. Uh, you know, uh, one time I just 
went on Twitter and said, can someone get me in touch with Jasper Johns? And five minutes later, uh, a very blessed person slipped into my direct messages and said he would help me. And then I did. That's great. That's great. Um, Sarah, did you, Sarah, David, Bob, did you find yourselves traveling a lot in the, in the pursuit of your stories? I definitely did for the real Lolita. Um, because I was tra essentially trying to track Sally Horner's whereabouts, which took her from Camden, New Jersey, which is right across the way from Philadelphia. So I also went to Philadelphia because her abductor had ties to Philly and he took her to Atlantic City and then to Baltimore and then to Dallas and then to San Jose, California, where she was ultimately rescued. And maybe it's a little woo, but I just felt like even though I was writing a story that was predominantly set between 1948 when Sally was kidnapped to 1950, when she was rescued to 1952, when she died in um, a seaside resort town in South Jersey called Wildwood. I just felt like even though so much time had passed and so many things probably had changed between then and the time I was writing the book, but I really felt like I needed to physically be present in those places to kind of, you know, not just be exactly where she was, but just to kind of get a sense of, well, what was it like? Where were the schools that she attended? What were the streets like? How have things changed? How have they not changed? I mean, I still remember traveling down to Wildwood on the anniversary of her death. So this would have been August 18th of 2017. And I was walking down the boardwalk once by day and another time at night. So I decided to make a weekend trip of it. And I really felt something in both of those boardwalk travels, just being like, she would have been 15 years old on this trip, having a good time with her best friend, meeting a cute older boy. And Wildwood, I don't know for anyone who's listening in or, or among all of us, but it really does feel like a time warp to the early to mid 1950s, or it's trying so hard to be that time warp. And so it was very strange to inhabit that in 2017 and also try to interrogate what that time warp feeling would have been like. So there were just a lot of disparate feelings happening as I was walking down the boardwalk both times. So I'm so glad I did that. But obviously the pandemic has curtailed travel severely for the project I'm working on now, but I did manage to make it to San Diego, which will figure pretty prominently in the next book. And a similar thing kind of has happened there too, where I'm just trying to figure out where people were at any given moment. So even though a lot of time passes, I do feel like being in a place, even if it doesn't give you much, it'll always give you something. That must be, I'm, I'm just thinking how fascinating that must, that must be. I mean, to feel those sort of resonances coming down, you know, through decades, but they're there. I mean, you know, places have energy and they, keep it. Um, and, and, and then maybe they let you feel it. They, they let you feel it too. I, I, I've got a one story when Sarah was just telling hers, which is uh, for Killers of the Flower Moon. I'm a big believer in travel. COVID obviously changes things, but I'm not a big believer in phone reporting unless when you have to for follow-ups, because um, if people are alive, reporting takes place spontaneously, serendipitously, you get invited to dinner, things just happen, you get to observe people, you learn things unexpectedly, in an unexpected way when you break down that kind of formal barrier. Um, but uh, during Killers of the Flower Moon, I, and again, that was a historical story to, to a great extent uh, in the early 20th century, but I uh, was writing about an Osage woman named Molly Burkhardt, who's this kind of remarkable woman who, um, who uh, in many ways kind of straddled two civilizations and when she was just about seven or eight years old she was forcibly uprooted uh from where she lived uh in a wigwam with her family uh by the u.s government and forced to attend a missionary catholic school and she was taken on this journey across the prairie far away um and i had never uh, but again that story i had never been to a prairie before it's embarrassing to say um and it was kind of a new experience for me I remember when I showed up as this kind of New Yorker people, you know, uh, and I would, I rented a room and I would live in the town nearby. Um, and I would stay there for usually three weeks at a time. Um, 
And over time, people kind of got used to me, used to me being around the funny New Yorker who had never seen a shotgun, who didn't wear cowboy boots or anything. And, um, but when I was researching this woman, Molly, um, I found the old trail that she would have taken to get to the school. Um, part of it was still not overgrown. And so one night, she had to sleep there in the middle of the night because uh, it was a two-day journey by horse and wagon. So I drove out there. I could only go about halfway down the trail. Um, and I had remembered that Robert Caro, in researching one of his books, described about the electrification of Texas, how he would sleep out in the campsite. And so I camped out for that night uh, in the prairie by myself just to kind of experience it, much the way Sierra was talking about. None of those specific moments went into the story, and yet they completely informed my understanding of it, if that makes any sense. Makes great, that makes great sense. That makes great sense. Bob, is there a Bob's travel story? Uh, I totally agree that travel's essential. Uh, for, for my two books, it was about communing with people who are talking about some of the most difficult things about their lives and about the loss of loved ones who who, who I will never meet. So, so you have to spend time with them. The first time I met the family in Colorado for uh, for Hidden Valley Road, that morning I cut myself shaving really badly. So I met them with like toilet paper hanging off my face for half the day. So that was, it felt in retrospect, kind of like a Columbo move. Like it made me seem very disarming, I suppose. But but uh, I, in terms of a sense of place, uh, the, the state of Colorado is all over Hidden Valley Road and the way that they live there, flying falcons and being part of the Air Force Academy, the whole thing, helps to find them. And then in Lost Girls, much of the action involving one of the missing women in this serial killer case takes place in a small community called Oak Beach in Long Island that even though it's near New York City, it's basically a small town that, it's literally a small town where everybody knows everybody and they're filled with secrets. It's, it's like Peyton Place or Twin Peaks or something like that. And so that became essential to sort of understand that place and who was who and, and who is friends with whom and who is feuding with whom. And it became a whole, a whole thing in the, in the book. But I'll say one more thing about place and that's that it, it's tied up in sociology. I mean, the, the, the towns in Lost Girls are all, where all the women are from are all places where people are um, bobbing up and down along the poverty line, where options are narrowing, where jobs are drying up, where their grandparents had it better and their parents had it better, but now that things are just getting worse. And so those places really uh, are inextricably linked with the choices that the women in the book made. I'm thinking about the levels of empathy that you each have to bring to your to your work without without real without a real sense of authorial empathy. What I think you would end up with is something simply sort of cold and and possibly repugnant. Um, and and I think that the not the secret but the the the, the, the a chief ingredient uh, of, of 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 your books is this is this sense of authorial empathy. Now I I'm I'm thinking back to what was one of my favorite um, episodes of the original Star Trek series, which was the the one about the empath, and and marveling at how she could she could take anybody's wound and make it go away. But the problem, of course, was that she was absorbing everybody else's injuries. She was absorbing everybody else's pain to the point where it could possibly then kill her. You are all immersing yourselves in personal agonies and crimes and, 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 and violence and, and injustice. And what does that do to you on a daily basis when you're doing that work how does that make you feel and uh, how do you uh, uh, how do you get it out of your hands how do you get it out of your brain at the end of the work day or 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 do you or or do you um elon you're up um i mean to answer your last question i mean i didn't uh you know the the horrors of it and 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 the pain um, for me, was always sort of tempered by the admiration um, that I had for the people that I was talking to and 
and my astonishment at the story they were telling. So I was never receiving these stories as just unmitigated horror or unmitigated pain because, you know, I was just so in awe oftentimes in, in, in what I was hearing. And, you know, I, I guess to the extent that that was expelled at all, it was expelled onto the page. Um, but, you know, I, I would often tell my friends that as, as, as bleak as uh, the work could be and as bleak as the, the book is, and it is bleak, you know, in, in some ways, uh, you know, the, the, the story that's happening in the background is, is as bleak as the story that's happening in the foreground. Um, I never had an unhappy day working on the book because I was always, you know, just loving uh, the people I was talking to. Um, I have an inability to, to interview and to write about people that I don't like. And I never really had to do that with this book. I don't know if that answers the question. I, I think it answers the question gloriously. Thank you, David. You know, it's interesting when you when you when you write, and as I've gotten o older, I think doing this, you know, I'm very conscious. I've become just increasingly conscious and aware of when people tell you stories and they share your story, and you're dealing with real human beings, whether alive or dead. To me, that's the burden a reporter really does feel and constantly has to wrestle with. And you are bound by the truth. And I always tell that to people. Um, because some people, you know, want to tell their story in a certain way or want it to be authorized. And that's not what I do. Um, but you feel that 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 moral responsibility and that fear that you're not going to get it right or you're not going to, you know, there are things that are so hard to fathom with crimes. I mean, it was so hard for me to fathom what, the woman Molly Burkhardt went through when she discovered that the person she thought she loved had married into her family as part of a plot to kill her and the children they raised. I mean, I could never fully grasp that and what she would have gone through. Um, and of course our lives reporting are immeasurably easier. Um, it's easy to kind of romanticize what the reporter does. It's immeasurably easier. So one of the things that I did in that book was um, I started to collect photographs because I always felt like I was chasing history. And I started to collect photographs of uh, the people who had been murdered. And initially there was just a few, there was Molly's family members and I put them on the wall. And over time, as I discovered there were more and more victims, scores of victims, I would gather their photographs and put them on the wall. So each day it became a reminder to me when I came into the office, really what I was writing about and to just at least remind me of that burden because I think it's important to be conscious of it. I mean, that that's that's you know, it's it's a wonderful thing, the idea that you you can't undo uh what happened, but you can you can give it its due. You can you can you can almost exercise it. You can maybe try to bring some you know peace to a very unhappy uh to 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 an unhappy story. Bob, I would think that your work must have been particularly uh, particularly difficult. Yeah, the, the conversations with people were a constant reminder of, of what was lost and of the of things that had happened to them. With this most recent book, it was talking with people who had been sexually abused or, or had lost uh, many brothers to mental illness, had bas which basically they interpreted as a as some do as death. You know, you, you lose the person who you love so much because they're so transformed. And then they're reevaluating their families. There's just a lot of scars that they're dealing with. And in Lost Girls, it was a live and still is a live murder case. And, and so no matter what I'm doing as a reporter to find out more, I'm aware that the people I'm talking to at the end of the interview, their, their sister or their daughter is still dead and, and, and their lives are still forever changed. So it was hard to get away from. I, I do think that one thing we all share here on the screen is we, we all are trying to bring attention to things that otherwise would be forgotten in, in, many of our, in many of our books. Certainly, 
in Last Call, the digging that Elon did, I just was cheering every time a new police report surfaced. I said, yes, you got it, because it means that we know now in a way that people wouldn't have known before. And, and that, that helps it feel less like an exercise in rubbernecking or voyeurism and more, and more about something deeper and meaningful. I try to find meaning in it. That doesn't mean that I don't have days where I just want to watch romantic comedies all day long. But <laughs> you know, I try to find some meaning in what I'm doing. And, and I think that, I mean, I think that the idea of preserving and telling stories that might otherwise have been left behind or forgotten or people who've been left behind and left forgotten. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I'm not, I was about to say, it's like you're performing a service. Um, I, I know that we're getting, I think we're getting uh, up to the point where we're going to start taking questions from the audience. But I, I, I particularly, Sarah, I'm, I'm, since I, I am particularly fascinated uh, with the stories that with the stories that you tell in 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 the real Lolita, I, how how what was what was that like for you to try to 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 bring Sally back to the life? Zodiac Killer and Son of Sam? Oh, here we but go. Why have you never heard of the Last Call Killer? Was it buffering all this time? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my I'll, fault. <laughs> I'll give my answer really quick. I think the, the main thing that I wanted to get at is that ultimately, when working on our books or magazine pieces or projects, I think it's so important that we all, I mean, we all understand it, but that anyone doing this work understands that when you approach a source, you're basically asking them to tell you the worst thing that happened to them or something that is adjacent to the worst thing that may have happened in their lives. And that involves a tremendous amount of trust and responsibility. And certainly the way I've reported it out has changed as I've gotten more experience in terms of, you know, having more off the record conversations to begin with and just sitting with them. I mean, I remember talking with a source, a, a, a woman who I used a pseudonym for in the real Lolita and I, we'd had a co phone conversation and, and one of her siblings had sort of indicated that there had been trauma in her life. And so she was res reticent on the phone. And I just said, look, I'm happy to come out and see you and we can talk about this in person. And it took a few months to organize it. And I flew out to see her and we met in a coffee shop and just, it took time and then it took more time. And then I went to her house and we talked for hours and hours and hours. And that's what it takes sometimes to get people to trust you. And it's really important that they trust that they do that because you can let them down so easily. And I just feel that over and over and over again. So even though I think I'm pretty good mentally at approaching this and possibly I dissociate a lot, I don't know, but I, I can handle it for the most part but every now and then it would hit me like a gut punch and it was really important to take breaks and to rest and then come back to it. But I never felt like I wanted to stop. I never felt like I should walk away from this because ultimately the story mattered. Sally mattered. Anyone that I write a crime story about matters and their stories need to be told. Thank you. Thank you. And and so before we do go over to to uh, our audience and, and their questions, I, I think that Elon, you had a, a particular point that you very much wanted to make and needed to make about the intersection between you and your work and the people you're portraying. Yeah, I mean, it you know, it's been a multi year uh, project, uh, at the very least. And, you know, when you work on a book, you cross paths with dozens if not hundreds of people who help you out in small and large ways. And I just want to mention two people who uh, were vital and who should have lived to see today and didn't. And um, uh, the first is Rick Unterberg, who's a piano player at the townhouse and had been since 1989. And he died last April of COVID. Mm -hmm. And Rick would have been uh, over the moon by what was happening today. He was very invested in the success of the book and would always, you know, say, 
when this is made into a movie, I want to be played by Tom Cruise. <laughs> and, um, and, and then the other person who I was privileged to know for some years um, was my writing partner, uh, Lyra McKee, uh, an investigative journalist uh, from Derry, Ireland. And, uh, you know, she had approached me uh, about being writing partners because we realized we had the same due dates on our book. And she said, you know, it'll be as if we're pregnant at the same time. And she was writing this extraordinary book, um, uh, literally trying to find buried bodies of uh, men who had been killed uh, during the Troubles. And... Um, uh, nearly two years ago now, uh, you know, after she had uh, finished a couple of chapters, and I think I was on chapter three, uh, she was murdered uh, by some offshoot faction of the IRA. And, um, you know, it, she, she should have been here too. And, um, you know, I always felt that she was, she was a superior journalist, and I still think that, and um, she only would have uh, gotten better. So I just want to acknowledge her, her absence. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Elon. Um, I'm really, it's marvelous. I could have done this for three more hours just listening to you tell stories, but um, uh, we have to, uh, we have to uh, segue over and to find out what people who are here paying attention to you would like to know that we didn't get to. All right. Uh, so before we do that, I am going to share the video because I did figure out what I was doing wrong earlier. So now everyone can watch the magnificent video uh, celebrating the birthday. So here we go. Heard of the Zodiac Killer and Son of Sam, but why have you never heard of the Last Call Killer? In the 80s and 90s, he stalked New York bars and preyed upon gay men. This is where he found his victims. It was Thomas Mulcahy's last night in New York when he crossed paths with the last call killer at the townhouse bar. He would never be seen alive again. Peter Anderson's death a year before was eerily similar. Like Thomas, he spent part of his last night in the townhouse bar. Anthony Marrero was a sex worker near Rounds, a bar that catered to older men looking for young hustlers. He was last seen around the Port Authority bus terminal before his remains turned up in garbage bags in Ocean City, New Jersey. A beloved regular at the Five Oaks, Michael Sakara ordered a scotch and water at the bar and spent the evening talking to the man beside him. The killer dumped his remains in a trash barrel in Rockland County, New York. These men died two deaths, one by the serial killer and the other by the system that chose to forget them. Whether their deaths were buried in the AIDS crisis by New York's sky-high murder rates or by the police that chose not to focus on violence toward gay men. Bringing to light a little known piece of American history and detailing for the first time the victims of the Last Call Killer and the complicated lives they led. Elon Green's Last Call, a true story of love, lust, and murder in queer New York. On sale now. All right. Uh, fantastic. So we have a huge crowd here tonight and I am super excited to get to some of these questions. Uh, the first question that I wanted to ask is specifically about, um, or specifically to Elon. So Matt is asking, Elon, how did you decide to focus on the victims instead of the serial killer in Last Call? Um, well, I mean, part of it is I, I don't think serial killers are interesting. And uh, this one was no different. Um, but it was also just a matter of when I, you know, first began reading about the case, the case wasn't solved. And so there was no serial killer to find interesting. Uh, there was only what he had, uh, left behind. And, and those were these men. 
And I have this belief that uh, you can take any person's life, and if you look up at it closely enough, it will be interesting. And these men were no different. And they came from, uh, you know, different socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, they lived in different places. Uh, they, you know, uh, some of them uh, were in the closet, some were not. Uh, they were from different generations. And they all had different uh, stories that um, I just knew would allow me to write about, uh, you know, things even outside of their own lives and to contextualize them, um, you know, in their time and place. The next question is going to be from Alex. Um, so Alex says, where I work, we've had, uh, for Outside Magazine, we've had some vigorous debates in the past two years about what, we, what are generally called guidelines for reporting on suicide, which for example, strongly recommend that you don't print contents of suicide notes or describe details of a death scene. I'm wondering if any of you are running into these guidelines as rules you should follow at mags you write for, and I will kind of expand on that and say, like ask, you know, what makes you draw the line with your writing? I mean, I just want to tell what happened, but I don't think you need to get needlessly graphic. And I, the one time I wrote a story about a suicide, um, which was also a New York story now that I think about it, it was just really important for me to figure out who this young woman was and why she had decided to die by suicide in the way that she had. But even though it was a very dramatic end to her life, her life mattered a lot more and than how it ended. And so I think that's ultimately what it comes down to when reporting on a suicide or an accident or murder, or any kind of violent death, it's that figuring out how they led their life and who they were is a lot more important than how they died. Yeah, I would second that. I'd say the, that I think if, if suddenly Congress passed a law saying no suicide note contents in any works of journalism, I'm not sure people would miss the wording of a note in a story. Once you learned everything else surrounding the you know, the the episode, the, the actual language in the note could only be scarring. So I would, I mean, I, I can certainly understand the reasons why people would want a guideline like that. I personally haven't run into that guideline, but I, I could see why some people would want it. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I, I haven't really come across guidelines. I don't think, I'm trying to think if I ever came across a situation where I was writing about a suicide, the suicide note, death. I can't think of it offhand, but I've certainly been across many situations with violent deaths or last statements before executions or um and and i always want to be honest in recording what happens um you know if someone's standing before a firing squad what happened um if you're trying to show the horror of uh of a judicial homicide such as an execution i think it's important to detail the mechanics of it um, in the case of the Osage murders, I thought it was important to um, show the depravity and the violence. But that all being said, you really, there's like a, a, a rule just, I don't know an official rule, but just of never trying to be gratuitous or, or exploitive or relishing in a detail for no purpose. If it doesn't have a purpose to the larger point of the story, whether it's about a violence or about anything else, it just, there's no point. And I think, you know, the one thing in writing about true kinds is they can often tip into exploitive or gawking or, um, and you do want to avoid that. And, and, and I do think just to your question of rules, I think that's where editors and readers really come in because it's really helpful to have an editor who has a conversation with you or a reader you trust and say, okay, do we go too far? What do we need in that scene? And making sure that the final result that ends up in the page that readers see has gone through that filtering process, whether there's a formal rule or whatnot. I tend to agree. And I, I think that a lot of times reading true crime is thankfully less 
kind of graphic than most mysteries that I read. So it is a little, it makes it a little bit more palatable to read um, when it isn't so graphic. I'm gonna combine two questions. Uh, the statement from Army of Ash is, it strikes me that all true crime is history, but not all history is true crime. And I'm gonna combine that with Perry's question would you treat a historical true crime different from different than one that is very recent or perhaps ongoing in the present in terms of sensitivity toward interviewees, victims, and even your own safety? I mean, I, 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 I've never had, I don't know that I have ever written, I mean, I don't, I haven't written a lot of true crime to begin with, but uh, I suppose if I was ever confronted with having to write about something very recent, I would treat it the same way I would treat anything else. Um, because otherwise you're just doing beat reporting. I mean, it, you know, you, you sort of have an obligation to go into um, in depth as possible and um, to write about the larger issues at stake. It seems to me they're just different. They're very different challenges. You know, I think if you're doing a historical piece, whether it's about crime or not, you're desperate to get as much material as you possibly can so that you're not stuck folding in a lot of context and conjecture. You want, you want a, a, as much immediacy as possible so it doesn't feel old. And then with the current one, you've got, you've got issues with, um, with your interviews, with sources, and with people, and and emotion, you know, there's there's live things in motion. You're you're hurting cats, and that that there's that as well. I would say the one issue that came up for me, just a specific case, was for example with the with the book on the uh, killers of the flower moon about those sage murders was, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to. Uh, pull together evidence to identify suspects, suspects who had not been previously prosecuted. And in some cases, I was able to gather enough evidence to identify them. But I had to, at a certain point, I remember in the process, because I would get rumors or quarter facts or half facts. And I decided, even though these people were deceased long ago, there's no libel law, to apply the same threshold I would as if they were living, because I did not think it was fear, especially if they were dead and they couldn't defend themselves, to identify people unless I felt that I had the same evidence as if they were alive to identify them. I also want to bring up something to Bob's point about challenges, which is that when doing historical reporting, one thing that I'm always thinking about is, can I get to interview people in time before their time is up? In terms of my uh, talking, trying to find people who knew Sally Horner, I remember it took well over a year of trying to track down some working phone number for the young woman who was her best friend in the last year of her life. And it really, it was almost like dumb luck that I was able to sort of figure out what married name she happened to be still living under and a phone number. And I kind of crossed my fingers and called and she picked up and we had two wonderful conversations and then it turned out that she died less than I think six months after I last spoke to her so there really is a air but the grace of God go I when trying to find sources of a certain age and I think all of us have dealt with that to varying degrees that it almost feels like a race against time that you're not only running up against the bounds of historical memory but actual living memory and trying to glean what they know before there's no one left to impart that. I'm gonna sneak in one last question because it does bring us to a joyful moment. Uh, Hillary's question is, what would you say is the most moving or most joyful moment you had while researching a true crime piece? Um. Well, I, I mean, I, again, it's well, I only have a, a backlog of one book and one story, so I'm going to go with the book. <laughs> uh, 
Um, uh, you know, the best day I probably had, you know, from an information gathering perspective was hearing from a, uh, uh, the chief clerk at the Ocean County Prosecutor's Office. Um, I had found a, 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 a footnote uh, in a in a brief that was uh, sent to the judge, uh, alluding to the existence of a trial transcript for a bench trial in 1990 in Staten Island, and you know bench trial transcripts usually are not preserved for any reason, uh, but this one happened to be, and it was entered into evidence, um, and it was uh, a, a trial which, you know. Uh, Dem, you know, had the the testimony uh, of the man who would later be uh, the the murderer in New York, and it was the only time that there was a public record of him talking. And um, uh, so I filed, a, did a foil uh, for for the transcript, and uh, she was very eager to find it. She went down to the um, uh, the storage room, and she called me and she said, it's not there, it's not, it's not in the record. And she said, I'll go back tomorrow. And so she went back the next day, couldn't find it. And uh, went back the next day, couldn't find it. And then about, uh, I don't know, 24 hours before uh, my agent, who represents a couple of, of us, uh, was supposed to uh, send out the proposal. Uh, she emailed me. She said it was stuck to another file. She said, here it is. And she had attached a 60 page transcript. Didn't ask for money. She just said, here it is. You know, have a good weekend. Mm -hmm. And, and I almost just hit the ceiling with happiness. And I called her and said, you know, can I send you flowers? She said, no, we're not allowed to accept any outside gifts. She said, I, I said, okay, like, I, can, can I advocate for you getting a raise? She said, no, we're on like a pay scale. Uh, she said, that's not happening. Uh, I said, okay, but just anything I can do, this is, I was, I, it was glee is the only way to describe it. and. You know that that's three thousand words of the book, and um, I never had another day like that. This makes me think of um, of being of after a year and a half of asking a state hospital in Colorado for medical records on the Galvin family brothers. Suddenly, one day, I was in the cellar. Um, with a member of the Galvin family and the door opens up and these people walk in with two metal carts, both overflowing with accordion folders <laughs> with tiles on, on every member of the family that ever went there. And it, you know, I don't think I'll ever have a moment like that again. It's yeah. like, yeah. Oh. I was gonna say, it looks like we are pretty much out of time and I would love to have this conversation go on forever. I'm certain that the audience would as well. Just one last thing real quick. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. The last thing I just wanna say is I had a chance to watch Elon as he reported and researched this book over the years with such, I don't think I've ever seen a more dogged, curious, inquisitive writer and reporter and somebody who always approached the subject with such compassion. Um, and so to see him here today and to see the final result, when you speak about joys, you know, one of the great joys is watching other writers, people you admire and respect, create something and bring something into the world that stays with you. And so I, I don't always know what the greatest joy is of my own work, but it was such a great joy to sit down and read the final book that Elon has uh, produced. and I really encourage everyone who's listening tonight who hasn't had a chance to read it to, to go out and do it. <laughs> You're here. It's been so amazing to watch this book travel from being just a, a, an idea to the book. And here it is. And it's published today. And 
what prouder moment to be part of this and to celebrate Elon. 100%. Absolutely. Congratulations, Elon. Congratulations, Congratulations Elon. Congrats, Elon. Thank you, guys. And, and now it's time to conclude. Um, on behalf of Crime Reads, Left Bank Books, and Saladin Books, I would like to thank you for joining this evening and hearing one of the most brilliant, moving conversations that I have ever been party to. That was wonderful. Everyone in the audience tonight should have a signed copy of Last Call. If it hasn't already arrived, it will soon. And if you would like an additional copy of Last Call, please see the link in the chat. Good night. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Night.